Okay, uh, we have the pleasure of having with us Professor Janusz Mlinacic from ADH University in uh, Krakow. Uh, he's an associate professor there. He did his PhD at the University of uh, Paris Sud and the AGH University in Krakow uh, on electromagnetic wave propagation in the ionosphere. And he's an expert in ELF measurement uh, radio wave propagation, antenna design, atmospheric electricity, uh, and so on. We, uh, Professor Trit uh, Dr. Tritakis met uh, Janus uh, at some conference, and now uh, Janus has installed his equipment of measurements of uh, radio waves in the ionosphere. Uh, uh, he installed his equipment together with our equipment uh, uh, near the top of Mount Parnonas where we have a station that measures CLF from the uh, ionosphere. So we are very interested to hear what he has to say on his general uh, scientific interests. Janus, please. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so today, as you know, I'll be talking about extremely low frequency electromagnetic waves. <laughs> and uh, I guess some people are not familiar with the topic. So I will start with an introduction. Uh, what is the ELF? Uh, the ELF is the range of uh, radio frequencies. So the lowest part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And within this lower part, the lowest frequencies. Uh, there are many definitions of the ELF waves. Uh, some uh, consider this as the frequency range between 3 and uh, 30. Uh, hertz. Others say this is between 3 and 300 hertz. Uh, some other definition says 2 hertz to 2 kilohertz. But in general, everybody agrees that those are the electromagnetic waves with frequencies which are below 3 kilohertz. So in geophysics, usually people just say, yes, we are below 3 kilohertz, so this is ELF. So ELF is this lower range of radio frequencies. Uh, other frequencies uh, that you uh, may be interested in, uh, what happens in the other frequency frequencies. So in VLF, uh, we have some military communications. In uh, low frequency, at low frequencies, we have radio, uh, AM radio. Same in the middle uh, frequencies. In high, at high frequencies, we have ionospheric pro, uh, communications. And the frequencies that we all know are uh, DHF, because FM radio, and UHF, because in this frequency, this is the most popular frequency range. Here we have uh, mobile uh, cellular telephony, we have Wi Fi, we have television. Uh, so uh, most communications happen in the frequency around one gigahertz. So GSM, for example, or 3G, 4G communications uh, are all within this uh, UHF frequency range. The upper uh, higher frequencies are used mostly for satellite communications and for radar. So for example, short distance radars for cars uh, are built in the EHF frequency range. Uh, did, uh, satellite television is at around 12 gigahertz. So we are really at a very low frequency. That's why they are called extremely low frequencies. We are much lower than any other communication systems. Uh, now, let's uh, convert this uh, frequency into the wavelength. Uh, so 3 kilohertz is equivalent to 100 kilometers. That's the length the wave has. And uh, if we look uh, at lower frequencies, for example, 300 hertz, this, this is equivalent to 1,000 kilometers. And 10 hertz is 30,000 kilometers. So why this is important? Because these waves are so long that they cannot fit between the Earth and the ionosphere. They are actually, the distance between Earth and ionosphere 
is smaller than the wavelength. That's why the propagation here, we say that it, 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 uh, the, the, these waves propagate in the Earth ionosphere waveguide because those two uh, uh, spheres form a waveguide. These waves cannot penetrate too deeply below Earth because Earth acts as a co conductor and they cannot easily escape the ionosphere because also ionosphere acts as a conductor. So you can imagine this propagation of these waves as the propagation between two plates, two conductive plates. Uh, not perfect conductive plates, so the, uh, the waves will actually be able to penetrate the earth to some distance and penetrate the ionosphere to some distance but most of the energy will propagate between the ionosphere, uh, the Earth and the ionosphere. And the propagation we say is unimodal because there is only one mode of propagation. This wave, there are uh, no other modes. Uh, let's make it simple. So uh, from the point of view of propagation, uh, this is, uh, the propagation is quite simple because it's unimodal but there are other complications, which I will describe later. Uh, so if we are able to generate an ELF wave, this wave will propagate between the Earth and the ionosphere. And the attenuation is very small, is extremely small in this frequency range. So an ELF wave, generated by a powerful source can propagate around Earth even a few times. Only after propagating a few times around uh, the Earth, it can it will vanish in the background noise. Uh, Janus, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, if you talk about propagation, can we think about uh, like a standing wave uh, yes, yes, because uh, I'm starting just with, you know, the propagation. So it, let's say we have a source here and this wave propagate in both directions around Earth. Since it can propagate many times, the standing wave will form inside the waveguide. And we will see this in the spectra, that actually there are standing waves inside the Earth ionosphere waveguide. Same. So we'll see that uh, later. Uh, this is actually, the reason is that the, the attenuation is very low. Since the attenuation is low, uh, if we are somewhere in here, let's say, uh, uh, once this wave is generated, it will reach the receiver from one side, then from the other side, and then all uh, the wave will pro keep propagating and will reach the receiver one more time, two more times, and the standing wave will form. So we'll see that uh, in the late, uh, later. Uh, why uh, I said the attenuation is extremely small. Here we have a simple model, actually simple model, but the best we have. And one of the goals of my research is to improve those models based on experimental data. These models are already based on experimental data, but not that many data and different uh, data points that I used for this model uh, comes from different uh, research groups. So there, uh, there is no consistency. Uh, and my one of my goals is to do all this uh, myself using my equipment so that I can be very confident in the results. But let's look at this plot, what we can see here. Um, the attenuation, the first plot shows the attenuation. Attenuation depends heavily on the frequency. Uh, for example, at 10 Hertz, the attenuation rate is only 0.25 decibels per megameter. Uh, we often use megameters in ELF. One megameter is of course 1000 kilometers. So we lose in attenuation rate, we use, lose only 0.25 dBs at 10 Hertz. 
per 1,000 kilometers. Uh, that's why this wave can propagate around the world. Uh, but this attenuation goes up when the frequency increases. So for example, at 100 Hertz, it is around 1.3 dB per megameter. Uh, the phase velocity, this is the this other plot, is the phase velocity, the propagation speed compared to the speed of light. So the propagation speed is smaller than the speed of light, but the lower the fre frequency, the smaller the propagation speed. For example, here at 100 Hertz, uh, during the night, the propagation speed is at 1.1. Uh, 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 so the speed of light divided is only 1.1 larger than the uh, propagation speed in the waveguide. But uh, at, for example, 4 Hertz, it is 1.5 times larger. So the propagation speed is 70% uh, of the speed of light at 5 Hertz and uh, up to 80%, around 80% of the speed of light at 100 Hertz. And as you see, it depends on the time of the day. During the night time, it is different. During the daytime, it is different. Same for the attenuation. So this um, complicates the propagation. It is unimodal. So I first said it is easy. It's easier than the other frequency ranges because we have no multipath propagation. But at the same time, it is complicated because it depends on the time of the day and not only time of the day. It depends on the solar activity, for example. It depends on the season. So it, it depends, uh, it, it varies, uh, not much, but it varies depending on the also extraterrestrial things like, uh, like the solar activity. So uh, uh, one of the goals is actually to study it through the year and through the solar cycles to see how this velocity and attenuation changes. How do we measure ELF waves? So the measurements are very complicated. Uh, to set up the measurements, it's very complicated. So it takes time to set up the measurements and to fix all the problems. But basically what we need, we need a remote place. This is actually, uh, th those are the photos from the installation in Colorado, USA, where we have one of our equipment. So you can see in this first uh, here photo that uh, this is a really remote place. It's uh, around 300 kilometers from Denver in a, a very remote area where there is nothing around, as you can see. So how do we uh, do the measurements there? We have to hide our equipment because it will stay there for three months or two or three months before someone will come and read the data. Uh, so here you can see me uh, uh, adjusting the antenna, uh, the coils, the antennas. Uh, and uh, this is the logger with the batteries. And uh, later it will be all covered with uh, the ground so that no one can see it. And hopefully we, it will survive uh, there, uh, will survive rain, which is uh, uh, often a problem, uh, heavy rain, for example, sometimes water, there's a lot of water around. Uh, the receiver, and also it ha has to, uh, it can't be stolen. We have to uh, really play, uh, put it in a, in a place which is safe, but to do our best so that it is uh, hidden. Uh, how this equipment is built? It contains two magnetic antennas, so two coils. Uh, we place one coil in the north-south uh, direction, and the other coil in the east-west direction, because we we'll want to measure also the direction of arrival of the waves. So we have two coils perpendicular, uh, one pointing towards north, the other pointing to, uh, towards west. We have a cable. Uh, this is all underground. Yeah. Then we have an underground cable and an underground container, which contains the logger. Uh, why we need a remote area? 
because we need a very small man-made noise. A power line noise, that's one of the source of noise, but also the noise in general in this frequency range. Close to the cities, there is a lot of noise uh, coming from, uh, from moving objects, from cars, from industry. Uh, so it's very uh, it's impossible to do measurements close to, in the cities or even very close to the cities. Uh, why we use magnetic antenna so coils? Uh, because we can place them underground at the shallow depth underground. Why? Because the I said that the earth acts as a conductor, but not a perfect conductor. So actually the magnetic field can penetrate the ground up to hundreds of meters. Uh, so if we place the coils uh, just a few centimeters below the ground, uh, this doesn't change anything for the recording. The attenuation is negligible, but at the same time, uh, they are hidden from the view. Uh, they keep, they are in a relatively constant temperature which helps calibration. Uh, so, uh, and also less uh, local noise. Uh, by local noise, I mean, for example, white animals uh, around the, our, our equipment. Uh, so here uh, is our second installation in Patagonia in Argentina. This is also, as you can see here, a very remote uh, place. <laughs> Uh, this uh, this is a <laughs> we joke this is a watchdog because it is a, this is the local dog that very was very interested in our installation and how those uh, does those coils look like so here you can see the two coils they are roughly one meter long they have uh, the ferret uh, permalloc core and a lot of wires of uh, copper. So, so basically it's a, a larger version of a magnetic uh, antenna, which you could find in a radio receiver for AM radio. It's just much larger. And what the, the logger, our logger contains a GPS receiver, GPS antenna and receiver, because in our case, uh, the timing is very important. So we synchronize the receiver, adjust the timing every hour, just to be sure we have a very precise timing because the kind of research we do uh, needs a very precise timing. Some ELF research doesn't need a precise timing, but the, some requires a very precise timing. So we have, uh, of course, an analog to digital converter and we store the data on a memory card. And here is our installation in uh, Parnon in Greece, uh, which uh, thanks to your institute and Vasilis, uh, we could install the equipment there. And uh, this is actually, we were very lucky with this installation. Why? Because here we don't have to worry about uh, water leaking to our equipment, about some rodents uh, cutting our cables underground, about our equipment being somewhere without any protection being stolen. So uh, we are in this very nice shelter from the for, uh, forest services there in Parnon. And uh, we have constant temperature for the measurements. We don't have to worry about uh, very high temperatures during, the, uh, during summer, for example, in Colorado, and very low temperatures in winter. Uh, so this is a, a perfect place for the measurement. Of course, we had to solve some strange problems at the very beginning. Uh, for example, uh, it turned out that the window shades were vibrating. So when the coils were close to the window, uh, the window is vibrating and destroying the measurement because this vibration was hap uh, happening at the frequency, which is very important for, for us, uh, around between 10 and uh, 15 Hertz. Uh, also, the, uh, when 
one of the coils was very close to this door, I mean, which we see you see in, in this photo. We had also problems uh, because this door was uh, also vibrating sometimes. Uh, sometimes we also see people that are uh, visiting this place, but those are very short episodes. Uh, uh, recently, we also installed uh, the solar panels. So now uh, this installation now works on solar energy. So hopefully, because this is uh, new, uh, hopefully this installation will not require recharging the batteries. And uh, hopefully it, it will just require to come and, and read the data. And actually in Greece, we have a more, uh, we have our last generation equipment. So here in those two places, we have an older equipment. In Greece, we have our most uh, recent equipment, which covers the frequency range from 20 millihertz, so 0.02 hertz, up to one kilohertz, a very wide range of frequencies. Uh, why we need such a wide range, why do we want it to have such a wide range of frequencies? Because the larger the frequency range, the higher signal to noise ratio, so we can uh, record smaller lightning because we have a better signal to noise ratio. Also, we wanted to have a very low, low cutoff frequency. Uh, typically, everyone measures in the frequency range ranging from one hertz or three hertz up to around uh, 40 hertz. And in our case, we wanted to go lower in the frequency because uh, we saw that some very interesting lightning discharges have something that we call the continuing current. So what happens? Uh, what happens is that after a strong lightning stroke, the current flows, and sometimes it, this current will flow for hundreds of milliseconds. And it will be a steady current flow. And with such a, in order to record such a steady current flow, we need to have a very low uh, cutoff frequency. So 20 millihertz allow us to record this current. If we, uh, if our equipment uh, was recording from one hertz, we lose uh, the continuing current. It will be filtered out if it is very long. And some discharges are, uh, have very long continuing current. Uh, now, what we can see in, in a measurement. So this is a, a, a 10 minutes of measurements. We measure continuously. This is just, I selected 10 minutes of measurements uh, in Greece from June. And I want to show you what we can see. So basically we can see some spikes. We have two magnetic coils. One is aligned with east-west and the other with north-south. So when I see a spike, a, a, a blue, a, a spike in a blue line, I know this is a discharge that happened in the northern direction. Uh, so this could be a discharge coming from Northern Europe, for example, uh, or from uh, Africa. When I see a red a spike in red color, then I know it is coming from east or west. So it could be, uh, for example, Turkey, Cyprus, could be France. If the discharge has both components, some amplitude in the in blue and in the red colors. This means it is coming from the direction in between, somewhere in between. And using the amplitude, uh, I can say this is, for example, 45 degrees, and I can say where this discharge, uh, uh, what, uh, what is the great circle on which this discharge was located. So looking at this recording, we can say that the main source of ELF waves is lightning. So lightning discharges, 
uh, those that we know, that everybody uh, knows, and also some unusual lightning discharges, which I will show you later. Uh, so here uh, you can see how, uh, based on the amplitude on the recording, I can tell the direction from which the signal was coming. Uh, so this is just an example. This is 30 uh, May recording in Greece. And uh, I know the amplitude in the north-south channel. And I know the amplitude in the perpendicular channel. Based on this amplitude, I, I know the direction. And then uh, if I have just one station, I know only the direction. And I don't know if the signal is coming from in front of the uh, of the coils or from the back of the coils. So here in the, you can see the location of Pernon, and I am tracing uh, two possible directions, uh, west and east direction. And then using lightning detection network, I actually saw that this lightning was located in Cyprus. So the, uh, based on uh, now the amplitude, I can say it was a positive cloud to ground lightning. Sometimes the polarization is very important. And the ELF, one of the things that no other frequency range can tell without ambiguity is the polarization. So for example, lightning detection network, which works in a higher frequency range, is very good at location. So they can tell me what is the location of this lightning. But if I want more information, they cannot provide it because uh, they are good just at the location. So having the location, I can tell, for example, the polarization. And also I can tell uh, the energy. What is the energy of this light? Yeah, uh, so this is the, the, uh, the first case, and here uh, the second case uh, where the lightning was coming from France, and you also see that actually uh, the direction was uh, very well, uh, it's quite accurate, uh, yeah. once again based on two amplitudes. A question, the duration of the event is a few milliseconds, is that the lightning event, what we're seeing here? Yes, this is a lightning event. For a few and, and what we have to uh, say on top of that, this is a lightning event, but it is observed in the ELF range. So uh, the length, the minimum length that I can see is uh, defined by my anti-aliasing filter, so by, by the bandwidth. So actually, I can, uh, if this lightning is just a delta Dirac, I will still record a larger impulse uh, because I have not infinite bandwidth. So no. when when the frequency range is smaller than infinite, uh, instead of one spike, I will record uh, just this kind of waveform. So of course, when it is longer, uh, it could sometimes it could be longer. Like the current could go like this. So we're seeing the resolution of your system or the actual duration of the lightning here? So uh, I know that when the lightning here, uh, when I record the shortest, this is actually a very short lightning. And this is, uh, uh, I know it because I know the duration is uh, of the rising and falling edge is the same. This means it is defined by my system. Uh, and here, actually, one kilohertz was very important because if my bandwidth was, for example, similar to your equipment in the Farnon, you will record something like this because you don't have enough bandwidth to record a sharp impulse. So the larger the bandwidth I have, the better I can tell the minimum duration. Okay. So here, actually, this is... Uh, I, I I can't tell more than this lightning was shorter than what I can recall. And of course, in some cases, it, uh, it will be much longer. So here it is defined by my equipment. Uh, but I, I, I will show you some other examples later. So 
the other thing that we can do with this recording, so once we have such a recording, we can also uh, calculate the spectra. And here the standing waves come. So when we calculate the spectrum of this recording, actually this is this recording, you don't see, you see just the spikes. And uh, it doesn't look like there is any structure, a uh, particular structure in it. And then when you calculate the spectrum, you get the spectra from the two coils. From the one, one coil is in red and the other coil is in blue. And what we can see, we can see the resonances because we have the standing waves just because these waves propagate around the world and they interfere with each other. And because there is a tens of lightning every second somewhere in the world, we have, we always see the resonances and they are called the Schumann resonances. So here we see the six Schumann resonance modes at eight Hertz, 14 Hertz, 20 Hertz, 26, 33, 39. These are just uh, relative, uh, related to the, uh, to the length here of the propagation path. Since this is 40,000 kilometers, uh, you have to also include that the speed is not the speed of light. Once you include, uh, once you take into account the propagation speed and the length of the circumference of the Earth, uh, you can uh, immediately see, uh, predict that there will be resonances at uh, at those frequencies because of standing waves, and those uh, frequencies are not the same all the time. And actually, one of the research that the very interesting research is the observation of the Schumann resonances, observation of the frequencies, and based on those frequencies, we can tell, for example, the solar activity, we can tell the uh, where the lightning, most lightning happened. Many things can be tell, told just based on, on the spectra. And this is just a very narrow frequency range here so that you can see the spectrum. Uh, so uh, just to uh, sum up, uh, main nat natural source is lightning. There's a lot of lightning, happens all the time, happens all the time. So there are standing waves in the Earth Ion Sphere Waveguide. And if you calculate the spectrum, you get the Schumann resonance. But what if we look outside? And this is a typical range of ELF equipment. Uh, our equipment is broadband, so we see more than that. What we can see more? So here we, uh, I plotted the spectrum from one hertz to one kilohertz. Uh, what else we can see? We, uh, this is in logarithmic scale. So once again, you see the Schumann resonances, but we see some more interesting thing. First thing we see is the spike at 50 Hertz. This is the power grid, 50 Hertz power line. What's very interesting here is that we observe this power line. It is very large if you plot the spectrum and we observe it both in Parnon and in Poland, in Colorado, everywhere, even though there are no power lines around. So this shelter in Parnon there is no power lines. There is no power line coming here. The closest power line is around five kilometers from here in a village. So why do we see this uh, power line? Because the lines that carry the power to our homes, to our, to our industry, the current flows through the, the line. So if the current flows, the magnetic field lines around form, and the, this field can be observed at large distances. Here, uh, for example, five kilometers away, but uh, I will remove uh, everything so that you can see it better. What we can see uh, here, we can see 60 Hertz. There is no 60 Hertz power lines in Europe. 
So what happens, and it is rare, that's why I chosen the spectrum from Poland, not from Parnon, from Greece, because this is a case where we saw the power line from the American power system. This could be Brazil, this could be United States. They use 60 Hertz. And during summer, uh, when they use probably a lot of power for uh, air conditioning, maybe for industry, we, we see, and the propagation conditions are good, we see the power line coming from there. What else we can see? We can see here a spike at 16 point, 67, one third of the power line. This is the recording from Poland. And this uh, frequency is the frequency of power line of the German and Austrian trains. There are no trains running in Poland. The trains use DC, same I guess in Greece, because we don't see this power line in Greece often. So the signal also comes from some, uh, some distance, uh, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, something even more interesting, uh, you can see here a, sp a spike at 32, uh, 82 hertz. This is a communication system with submarines. This is a Russian system for communication with submarines. Why? Because they know that they can have a global, uh, let me remove everything. So they know they have, if they put a transmitter somewhere in Russia, they can reach a submarine anywhere around uh, in the world. You can't transmit much at these frequencies, but you can transmit enough to say for them the mission is over or to say you can now use satellite communications, you can go up with your uh, submarine because there is no other boats around. So they use it for communications with submarines. What also we see, we, we see the uh, harmonic frequencies of the power lines here. And also we see any other noise uh, coming from, uh, from uh, industry from man made uh, some man made noise but uh, so we need a nice a place far from any noise and battery power we still see those lines they are not a problem as you can see uh, here in the recording they are filtered out i know exactly the frequency i can filter them in software so now about the research uh, what is the use of elf in research so there are two main branches of research in DLF. The first one, which is probably known better, and I will not uh, talk about it today, is the Schumann resonances, because it is also studied in your institute. So the Schumann resonances, they allow us to study uh, the lightning, the global lightning activity. Since we can study the global lightning activity, we can also study the climate because uh, how it uh, evolves, how the lightning evolves, and lightning is related to humidity, is related uh, to convection. So we can study climate with, uh, with the Schumann resonances. We can study solar activity because it turns out they depend on the solar activity. We can see also solar flares. Uh, they will influence the frequency. So uh, a lot of research can uh, is done uh, is performed in just based on uh, this frequency range. Also earthquakes. The other branch of research, uh, which is particularly interesting to me, is to study individual lightning discharges, not the spectra, but the time domain. What uh, interesting happens? So uh, very recently, a strange kind of lightning was discovered. It turns out that more, uh, lightning that we know uh, actually uh, uh, discharges between the cloud and the ground. So we know it as uh, lightning strokes. They hit the ground. But what people saw around 20 years ago for the first time is that there is some unusual lightning that happens above the clouds. Here you cannot see that this is above the cloud because it is recorded from a hill, 
but actually here the, the, the altitude is around 50 kilometers and here it's around 90 kilometers. So this lightning, you cannot see it from the ground if you are be below, but we have an observer which is located on a very high mountain and he see what happens above the clouds. So he see uh, lightning above the clouds and he records those uh, this lightning. Based on our recording, so this is actually what, uh, what uh, was recorded uh, in the ELF. Based on this recording, this is the those are the magnetic field components. I can reconstruct the current at the source, so I can tell exactly what kind of current was flowing in this discharge. So here you see that this current was quite long. Uh, this is uh, the first, uh, uh, the rising edge is the, uh, how fast it rises defined by my equipment. The higher I, the bandwidth value have, the better I will, uh, tell, I will be able to tell. But you see that the, the falling edge has some kind of structure. And actually what happened it was there was a lightning hitting the earth. This is uh, this first spike. And then the current was flowing between the cloud and the ionosphere because the a break, breakdown happened above the cloud at the distance uh, at the altitude of about 60 kilometers. And this is actually the current that is flowing between the cloud top and the ionosphere. So it's very uh, interesting to be able to, to tell that. And uh, we can also say what was the charge moment, so what was the energy of this lightning? What actually amount of charge was removed from the cloud to the ground and to the ionosphere? And based on that, we can learn about those discharges. Some people are modeling them, trying to understand why they happen. Now we know this, there's a breakdown uh, above the cloud when a lot of charge is first going down to Earth. Uh, and we learn also about the cloud structure. This is another case, very recent. Uh, this is actually uh, the first uh, ever observation of a very uh, unusual lightning. This is CAN, and uh, uh, here you can clearly see that this discharge happened above the cloud. So uh, you can see the coast, you can see uh, the mountains here, the cloud and the discharge above the cloud. Here you can see it in uh, 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 just this part above the cloud. Based on the uh, optical recording, uh, we are able to say that uh, it started at 11 kilometers and ended at 16 kilometers. And actually based on the, it is similar to so-called blue jet, which is a known discharge. But this, in this case, it has an inverse, uh, an opposite polarization. Actually, some uh, uh, people will try to understand, maybe some PhD students will work on this, to understand to what happened. Probably the cloud had the opposite polarization at that point. So it had a different polarization. It is like the beginning of, of a, a, a so-called gigantic jet. And here, uh, this is just uh, a plot from the publication where uh, we had many different instruments and uh, including the ELF. And in the ELF, this blue plot is actually the current flowing. So I, I, don't, I won't go into details here just to tell you uh, very roughly how I can know the current. So I know that some lightning happened. If I can model the radio wave propagation between uh, in the Earth ionosphere waveguide, and I can record this, then using an inverse method, I can figure out what was the timing and what was the current flowing in uh, at the source, because I know uh, where the source was. I know if I know well the attenuation, the speed velocity. I can reconstruct actually the current. And based on that, uh, other people can model those discharges and can understand why they happen and uh, how exactly uh, they happen.
so um, uh, just a, I see I don't have much time, so a quick summary. Uh, uh, so e uh, ELF is the only frequency range where we can measure the charge moment change, which is uh, equivalent to energy of the discharge where we can reconstruct the current moment waveform so we can exactly know the current flowing at any instance in this discharge. And we can also see this continuing current because other systems cannot see it because they have not enough bandwidth in the lower part. We need to go very low in the frequency to see a long current. Uh, and uh, I will move forward. Mm. Here I want to show you a powerful lightning. When the lightning is very powerful, so for example, this was in Caribbean, uh, you can see not only the, the lightning stroke, but also how it travels around the world. So uh, here you can see the wave that came from the other direction around the world. Here the wave that, uh, that we see for the second time, so it arrived at the receiver, it propagated around the world, and we can see it once again. So we also we see the dispersion uh, because this impulse is not as uh, uh, sharp as uh, at the beginning. Here also why we don't really need a very large bandwidth because there is a dispersion anyway. Uh, so uh, just to move forward, this is a case of uh, discharge somewhere close to Australia, recorded by uh, in Poland and in uh, Colorado in the United States. And once again, uh, we see the uh, the waves that travel around the world. So a very important use of uh, ELF can be to monitor strong lightning that occur anywhere on Earth. We need only three uh, installations, three stations, to be able to monitor the uh, strong lightning everywhere in the world. Here you can see a case where lightning happened near Ma Madagascar and was recorded in Poland, in uh, Colorado, and in Argentina. And based on this uh, recording in three different places, I can tell where this lightning happened. And also I can tell how strong it was, what was the charge moment uh, of this lightning. And it turned out uh, this is useful, not only for lightning research. For example, on the satellite, on the European Space Agency satellite, they were recording some signals which looked a little bit uh, strange. At the very beginning, they didn't know what is the source of the signal. This is a satellite at low orbit. Uh, and uh, when they plotted the spectra, they saw some lines. It turns out those are whistlers. And it turns out those are generated by lightning. So for example, in this case, I was able to find the source of the lightning to see that there were two strong lightning discharges and actually the energy, some energy, because more of these waves were propagating in the Earth ionosphere waveguide, but some energy was able to convert, to leak into the space. Actually, it converts on the, at the boundary between the Earth and the ionosphere, and was recorded on the satellite uh, as a whistler. Uh, so uh, here, uh, I, we are going into details. Uh, there is a satellite location, there is lightning location, and uh, the recording from the free ELF stations. Uh, this is another case uh, where actually uh, uh, two satellites in different locations on different hemispheres were recording the same whistler coming from the same lightning. And uh, sometimes there are uh, differences between uh, recordings of different satellites one satellite here, one satellite here, the discharge in between. So uh, based on, uh, on this, so we can also uh, model the ionosphere. So this, was, this project actually is, uh, the aim is to investigate uh, the whistlers to improve ionospheric models. 
uh, and to understand why those models are so different in different places. Uh, so this is a, so just last slide, some un unexpected recording uh, from my uh, last visit to Greece in December. Uh, so in December, uh, there were some hardware problems. Uh, I came to, to, to fix them and uh, we were testing the two coils uh, in parallel to see that they record the same thing. And we were testing them overnight and we recorded a very strange signals, two spikes. And uh, the most probable explanation, uh, first we're thinking uh, maybe uh, we know also that there were some wild animals are coming to this building. So, uh, and there was uh, some remaining food, uh, some nuts uh, from uh, uh, left by these animals close to the coils. So uh, we are first uh, very excited to think that maybe those are brain waves, the alpha waves, uh, but then uh, uh, probably a more probable explanation, this is heart rate. So there were two animals, two rodents, this is the actually the frequency corresponds to the heart rate of animals. If there were two animals, male and female, uh, or two smaller and larger, the the heart rate varies, like in human. And they were sleeping close to the coils, uh, one uh, one closer to one coil, the other closer to the other coil. So we recorded the signal. Uh, okay, so uh, just to conclude, ELF enable a wide range of research related to lightning, to earth environment. Uh, here I was showing you just some selected topics. There are a lot of different research topics. Those are the topics that I'm currently uh, the most interested in, but uh, I couldn't cover everything. Uh, so thank you for your attention and all questions are welcome. I just mentioned one thing. Uh, I apologize, I apologize because when I sent you the abstract, I realized only later uh, when I was checking the link, the Zoom, that when I was copying, I made some, uh, some. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit messy. So if you need to publish the abstract uh, uh, or if you can change it, I will send you an abstract, which is uh, better. Uh, so thank you once again and uh, all questions welcome. Uh, we can go back to the slides, explain some more, uh, whatever uh, you have in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janos. All this is very, very exciting. Uh, I would like to ask a very general question. Uh, how many groups uh, around the world are working in this field? I'm asking that because you alone can study the whole ionosphere from three stations that you have. So who else is interested in the study of ELF? Uh, there are not that many research groups. Uh, those active, very active, are maybe three or four that are actively working uh, uh, on uh, uh, actively doing research. And since there are not that many, we try to to collaborate together uh, because uh, our main problem is uh, just resources, human resources. There are not many people, uh, there is a lot of data already, but not enough people working on this data uh, because there are so many topics, so many interesting topics. So um, for them in Europe, we have, uh, so there is this, uh, tiny small group here in uh, Poland, in Krakow, uh, also a very small group in Greece, a, a small group in Hungary, but larger than our groups, because they have uh, they have five, six people, including young people doing PhDs. So I collaborate with them as well. And there is uh, also a very active group in, uh, in Spain, but also a very small one. And uh, there is a group uh, in the United States uh, and in Japan, uh, and some smaller groups elsewhere. But uh, but those those are the most active groups that I collaborate with. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have more questions here. Some questions. 
Uh, oh yes, okay. no. Hello, could you? Hello, I am Kostis Gontikakis. Uh, could you tell us uh, more things about how the uh, solar activity uh, influences the these, these waves? Thank you. Uh, how it influences the uh, since the propagation takes place between the Earth and the ionosphere and most dissipation and most, uh, practically the propagation is defined nearly completely by the ionosphere because the ground is nearly a perfect conductor. So uh, the ionosphere, the current state of the ionosphere has a large influence on the propagation. Since the propagation speed uh, varies based on the ionosphere and then also the frequency that we observe, it will depend on the current state of the ionosphere. Since uh, uh, ionosphere, you can get an extra X-ray uh, ionization, UV ionization when you have, for example, solar flares or when you have high, uh, when you have so high solar activity, you have more, uh, uh, more often solar flares then you also see it in the in the recording but you need actually it's a difficult study because uh, the frequency depends on two things one is uh, the uh, distance to the lightning source the main lightning source and the other is the ionosphere and the current state of the ionosphere and actually uh, in the here in the astronomical observatory in krakow uh, there was a group working specifically on how to uh, how to uh, separate those two effects and study only the solar influence, the, uh, the ionospheric influence. Uh, and uh, this group is now very small, but the Hungarian group is actually starting to use the same methods and hopefully they will be able to continue this research uh, because you can remove the influence of the uh, of the uh, of what of the lightning source and keep only the influence of the environment on the ionosphere and actually uh, we have uh, one publication which is showing how how much the Schumann resonance frequency uh, increased when we had a huge solar flare. Uh, this was published in 2016. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this was a postdoc study, so uh, it's not working with us anymore. The study was not continued, but hopefully this uh, Hungarian group will use the methods. So, uh, so for example, we, uh, we, we saw the solar flare, how it influenced the propagation. Also, uh, we have some uh, some publication. I'm not a co-author offer, but uh, and the main offer is retired now, uh, where uh, you can see the influence of solar cycles, the 11 year solar cycle, how this influences the frequency that we observe. Uh, so this is how we can uh, uh, so using the Schumann resonance basically. And for this, you don't need a large spectrum. You need just the Schumann resonances. And of course, you need to keep the measurements working continuously because you need a large set of data. You need 11 years of data just to study one cycle. Uh, so the more data you have, the better it is. And hopefully uh, also in Greece, uh, after some time, we have, we'll have enough data to do this kind of research because this equipment will be there for a long time. Uh... Okay. All right. Hello, Janus. Uh, here is Vasilis. And uh, at first, I wanted to make some comments on the technical part uh, of the installation in uh, Colorado and uh, in Argentina. I'm wondering how they protect them from humidity, from uh, water raining or uh, all uh, other uh, damages which they could uh, occur there. This is yes. the first. And the second is, where is supply? I don't see batteries anywhere. How, how uh, do you supply the logger? 
So uh, actually, you you see the batteries in this photo. Ah, uh, they. Uh, you see this green. You recognize the logger, this green box, and the three batteries inside. So and also here, you see uh, you don't see that much, but uh, yes, so here here you see only one battery because this was during installation, and normally there are three batteries, and this is the logger. Well. The very small batteries and how long they last? Uh, no, yeah. those are not small. Those are ninety ampere hours, so same oh. like in the uh, Parnon, and three batteries last for roughly three months, two to three months. Three months, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's quite that's good. Uh, I see. Also, they have very long coils. What more they gain from that? No, no, no. This is the same. Uh, just the pipe is very long because this was a standard pipe. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. so at first glance, they look very long. And I'm yes, wondering... yes, yes, because uh, actually I was doing this installation there. So uh, we came uh, uh, without any, uh, uh, we came just with the coils and we had to go to the shop and find the pipes. And the uh, smallest pipe was, I think, two meters. So, so we bought a long pipe uh, and put, uh, because this is uh, to, to your first question, how we protect from water. Yeah. So we put uh, the coils in the pipes, in the, uh, the, uh, inside the pipes, and we put some silicone around it, uh, and uh, we try to close it uh, very tightly. However, uh, we already, one, uh, one coil already broke, uh, after uh, seven years, uh, no, less than seven, yes, uh, something like five years, the water actually leaked into the coil. We had to send another coil uh, and uh, and hopefully it will last for some time. Also, the logger once broke because there, were, there was, what happened was, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the area where there's a lot of, uh, sometimes there's a lot of rain. And actually, when they came, the water was there was a few centimeters of water on top of the ground, and unfortunately, this leaked inside, and the equipment broke. Here in uh, Argentina, actually, uh, more than a year ago, uh, there was a lot of water, and once again, the equipment broke. Uh, we currently have no uh, money to travel there to exchange it. We uh, will produce a new logger and try to find some money to travel there, install it. That's why I said we are so lucky with Parnon, because here you don't have to worry that any time there will be so much rain, because those are hermetic, of course, boxes. But when there is a water, a few centimeters of water on top, yeah, yeah especially that also someone who takes the, reads the data, they have to open this box every two months, every three months. And if it is not closed very perfectly, if there are some, uh, uh, if there's some dirt remaining uh, somewhere, the water will leak inside. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, uh, it's very difficult uh, to do <laughs> it, 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 because you never know. Actually, you hope that you will get another two months of data, but you never know if you will get it because maybe the water will leak inside or someone will steal the equipment. So uh, that's a very difficult research from the hardware point of view, uh, unless you have such a perfect place where you, here also you have to worry a, bit, a little bit about someone st stealing something, but you have metal doors, it's very well protected and you don't have to worry about water. Water and excessive heat, because during uh, summer in Colorado, the, the temperature can be easily 40 degrees. In winter, it's minus 20. It's so difficult to keep everything working. And here we have uh, you know, constant, practically, the temperature doesn't vary a lot. Fine. Um, another question is, uh... I see that in all groups, uh, measurements are collected uh, uh, in the magnetic field with two uh, coils in the magnetic field. Why people uh, 
uh, skip the electrical measurements? Why nobody uses a vertical antenna or GAVA type to measure uh, sumo resonances in the electric field? Uh, so uh, uh, in our case, it is the explanation is very simple. If we put a vertical antenna here, everybody will see it and it, it won't last more than two weeks because someone will steal it. <laughs> so uh, so uh, once you have the magnetic antennas, you put them underground. You can't put an electric antenna underground. That's yeah. the main, the, the reason why we even started with the magnetic antennas. Uh, the, uh, also the electric antennas are uh, very difficult to calibrate and they are, uh, uh, there's a much larger influence of the objects around these antennas. So for example, moving trees, uh, because we did some experiments with this and actually uh, weather, because when there is rain, you have different uh, calibration. When there is no rain, different calibration. When, uh, for example, the, uh, you are somewhere in the fields, when the grass is higher, you have different measurement. When there is water below, different measurement. So magnetic antennas allow us to have constant measurements all the time and much, much less influence of uh, what happens around. Wow. Well. Perhaps we think uh, sometime to put uh, such an antenna in the interior of Parma, because there, I think it will work well. Electrical vertical antenna inside the building. Do you think it's a good idea? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think even trying it to see, uh, because inside, uh, first of all, we don't have the problem of, be, uh, of, of being stolen, or the, on the antenna being stolen. And also, uh, uh, the environment is always the same yeah. inside. So, uh, so I think it's a very, a very good idea to try it. Uh, right. of, of course, uh, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how to calibrate this, but uh, because magnetic coils are easier to calibrate because you put them inside a, a Helmholtz coils or, or just inside a solenoid and you calibrate them. Uh, with electric antennas, if you put something close to them, they will change the properties. Uh, but maybe they could be calibrated based on the magnetic recording. So you know what you record in the magnetic antennas and you use electric just for additional information, and you don't care about the amplitude being very, very precise. Right. Uh, last question, which is a rather silly question. Uh, do you think that there is any information? Uh, somebody could uh, get some information with a third coil in the OZ axis? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, close. Uh, actually, when you are far away from the lightning source, uh, there will be no uh, no important information in there. But uh, but if you are close, then uh, uh, you have the wave is not just a plane wave, uh, but it has uh, also some uh, uh, horizontal component in the other direction, some vertical component. Uh, so I think something about the ground also could be learned. Uh, there will be some additional information in, in, in this first coil. Not in the, for the Schumann resonances, uh, this is, I think it's useless because anyway, we record the waves that propagate around the world, those are standing waves. But for research on individual lightning, I, I think some interesting additional information could be obtained from the uh, from the vertical uh, but you need a free channel uh, receiver okay thank you very much Janus. Yeah, please, yeah. any other question by listeners or observers don't think that yellow okay okay uh, that's the end of the presentation thank you very, thank you very much Janus. Uh, thank you uh, Thank you for the invitation and uh, just uh, some last words. I think uh, uh, as you saw from the presentation, this uh, observation site in Greece 
it's a very very important uh, uh, it has some very uh, nice advantages so i really hope this will uh, stay there uh, you know forever even for the future generations to just be able to study our data and see how the the world evolved how the ionosphere changed how uh, how maybe some climate change some uh, how lightning change on earth uh, using continuous data for a long time so it would be really great uh, you know to keep keep this measurement site working we practically solved because we had many small problems as usual, but we nearly we solved nearly everything. Uh, now uh, and now we can uh, start uh, a long continuing measurement, which will be useful for uh, for young people, future PhDs, and so on. And and we must acknowledge this is due to Dr. Tritakis, who found the site and supported this effort for so many years. <laughs> So thank yes, you. a lot of effort to go there to keep to keep collaboration. So thank you, <laughs> Vasilis, uh, for keeping this uh, going and working, uh, spending a lot of time and effort to keep this measurement site. Thank you very much. Bye. No, okay. Thank you. Bye.